Hello, my name is Jesse Orkwine, and I am an Infectious Diseases Clinical Pharmacy Specialist at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. Today, I will be reviewing pertinent drug information for monoclonal antibodies as it relates to treatment and prophylaxis of SARS-CoV-2. Naturally occurring antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 are produced by the adaptive immune system within a few weeks of exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The degree of antibody production appears to correlate with severity of illness, but the duration of antibody memory remains unknown. The process of antibody-mediated viral neutralization can be sped up by directly administering antibodies to patients in the form of convalescent plasma or monoclonal antibody therapy. This is known as passive immunity. In contrast to convalescent plasma, monoclonal antibody therapies for COVID-19 contain known quantities of one or two specific antibodies that are known to target designated binding sites on the virus that correlate with viral neutralization activity. Additionally, these therapies are able to be mass produced without the need for convalescent donors. The monoclonal antibodies currently granted emergency use authorization are designed to bind to the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This protein has two functional subunits, S1, which is responsible for viral binding to the ACE2 receptor, and S2, which is responsible for virus cell membrane fusion. Within the S1 subunit, there are two domains, the N-terminal domain and the receptor binding domain. The receptor binding domain is the primary target for monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibody binding to this domain interferes with the usual virus-host interaction, and in doing so, monoclonal antibodies can serve as both prophylaxis for high-risk persons as well as for treatment in already infected persons. The specific mechanism by which monoclonal antibodies block viral entry into host cells differs based on the specific antibody. On this slide is the chemical structure of the receptor binding domain. Highlighted in green is the area known as the receptor interaction site or receptor binding motif. This is the portion of the receptor binding domain that interacts directly with the ACE2 receptor. This is also the area where the epitopes for bamlanivimab and etisevimab and casirivimab and imdevimab are located. In binding at this location, these two antibody products prevent binding of the virus to the host cell receptor. Sotrovimab binds to an area within the receptor binding domain outside of the receptor binding motif. Therefore, it does not compete with ACE2 binding. Rather, it prevents membrane fusion via an incompletely understood mechanism after the virus binds to the ACE2 receptor. In addition to antibody-mediated viral neutralization, monoclonal antibody administration promotes a number of effector functions, including antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity and antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis, which assist with recruitment of complement and or FC receptors, both of which stimulate the immune system to help clear the virus. Neutralizing activity is likely most effective in disease prevention. Thus, the additional effector functions play a more significant role in post-exposure treatment of SARS-CoV-2 infection. A tremendous amount of progress and change has happened with the SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibodies over the last year, starting with the first emergency use authorizations granted to bamlanivimab and casirivimab and imdevimab in November of 2020 and from there, mostly good things kept happening. There are currently three monoclonal antibody products, two combination therapies, and one single antibody product that have received emergency use authorization from the FDA and have sufficient information to discuss in this presentation. The first combination antibody therapy that will be reviewed is bamlanivimab and etisevimab, produced by Eli Lilly. Bamlanivimab was one of over 400 potential antibodies isolated from the serum of a convalescent COVID-19 patient. Based on certain desirable qualities, including ability to bind to the spike protein, greater neutralizing activity at lower concentrations compared to other contenders, receptor binding domain epitope competition, and ACE2 blocking activity, a few antibody finalists emerged. Despite similar RBD binding, ACE2 blocking, and binding affinities, Bamlanivimab, labeled in the figures as LI-CoV-555, showed substantially greater neutralization potency compared to the other finalists shown in the figures on the right side of the slide against two different viral isolates. This may be due to the ability of bamlanivimab to bind to its epitope not only when the receptor binding domain is in the ACE2 receptor accessible or up configuration, but also in the down configuration when the RBD is shielded from ACE2 receptor binding. 
Atisavimab was also identified from a convalescing patient. Two final antibody candidates were discussed, both with similar ability to block RBD binding. However, atisavimab, labeled as CB6, was selected due to stronger neutralizing activity as evidenced by the lower 50% viral neutralization dose as depicted in the figure here. Bamlanivimab has been studied as prophylaxis against SARS-CoV-2 in rhesus macaques. In this model, three to four animals per group were dosed with one, two and a half, 15, or 50 milligrams per kilogram of bamlanivimab, or 50 milligrams per kilogram of a control, and were subsequently inoculated with virus 24 hours later. Changes in viral load were assessed via bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, nasal swabs, and throat swabs collected on days one, three, and six. Viral load was described in terms of genomic RNA and subgenomic RNA. Genomic RNA represented virus present in both the initial inoculum as well as in newly replicating virus, whereas subgenomic RNA was specific to newly replicating virus. Changes in viral load over the six days post inoculation are shown in the figures on the right. Mean genomic and subgenomic viral concentrations were lower in all BAL and nasal swab samples on day one compared to the control group. Viral replication in BAL samples, as well as among all nasal swab samples, except in the lowest dose group, were undetectable by day three. In addition, lung tissue obtained via necropsy on day six revealed no evidence of viral replication in the two and a half, 15, and 50 mg per kg antibody treated animals. Etisevimab has been studied for both prophylaxis against and treatment of COVID-19 in similar animal models with rhesus macaques. In the prophylaxis model, a dose of 50 mg per kg was administered to three animals one day prior to viral inoculation. In the treatment model, three animals received the same dose but administered on both day one and day three after viral inoculation. Daily throat swabs were performed through day seven to determine changes in viral load. Among the animals receiving prophylactic antibodies, only minimal levels of virus were detectable starting on day one post-infection. Treatment doses of etisevimab caused consistent decline in viral load starting from day two post-inoculation. On day five post-infection, one animal from each of the three groups was euthanized and necropsied with limited pathological lung damage noticed in both the prophylaxed and treated animals. The most pertinent clinical trials involving the combination of bamlanivimab and etisevimab for either treatment or prophylaxis are listed here. Both phase two and phase three results are available from Blaze one. In addition, press release data is available for some of the arms of the Blaze four trial. To date, only information pertaining to the bamlanivimab monotherapy arm of the Blaze two trial has been published. The available data for all of these trials will be discussed in detail on the following slides. The BLAZE-1 trial assessed the effects of bamlanivimab with or without etisevimab on non-hospitalized adult patients reporting at least one symptom of mild to moderate COVID-19 disease. Subjects also had to have had their first positive SARS-CoV test result within 72 hours of receiving the antibody infusion, and there was no limit on how long the patients were symptomatic prior to enrollment. The phase two results of this trial were released in two separate publications. The first discussing only the results of Part A, which was focused on the antiviral activity of three different doses of intravenous bamlanivimab monotherapy. These results will not be discussed in detail here, but rather as part of the second publication, which provided the results of Part B, along with updated results from Part A. The Phase two portion of Blaze 1 had a primary endpoint of viral load change from baseline at day 11, with secondary outcomes looking at the clinical outcomes of symptom improvement and hospitalizations, ED visits, and death. Published results from Part B of the BLAZE-1 trial included data from the 309 patients receiving bamlanivimab monotherapy in Part A of this trial, along with 112 patients randomized to receive a combination of 2,800 milligrams of bamlanivimab and 2,800 milligrams of etisevimab, or placebo. The vast majority of patients had mild disease, with the onset of symptoms occurring four days prior to randomization. 67 patients in the combination therapy arm had risk factors for progression to severe disease, which were defined as age 55 or older, body mass index of 30 or greater, or at least one pre-specified medical condition, including diabetes, chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory disease, 
immunosuppressive disease, or treatment with immunosuppressive therapy. The primary outcome of mean log change in viral load among patients receiving placebo was a decrease of 3.8. Results in this study are slightly different from the initial bamlanivimab monotherapy publication and showing that none of the three monotherapy doses administered resulted in significant improvements in viral load change compared to placebo. However, the combination of bamlanivimab and etisevimab resulted in a mean log change in viral load of 4.37 which was a significantly greater change when compared to placebo. This difference in viral load between patients receiving the combination antibody, shown in blue in the box plot on the left, and placebo, the box in red, was evident by day three. However, this early decrease and overall greater decrease in viral load by day 11 did not affect viral clearance, symptom improvement, or symptom resolution at any of the reported time points on day 7, 11, 15, or 22. Symptom scores between patients receiving combination therapy and placebo were only significantly different in favor of patients receiving antibody therapy at day 11. The median values for time to viral clearance, time to symptom improvement, and time to symptom resolution are shown here for each of the monotherapy doses, the combination therapy group, and patients receiving placebo. Overall, monotherapy and combination therapy appeared to be similar in terms of their effects on these clinical outcomes. The most anticipated trial results are shown here. There were no deaths reported in any trial patient, regardless of whether active treatment or placebo was received. Hospitalizations and ED visits were lower in all groups of patients who received bamlanivimab with or without etisevimab, with rates of 1-2% to among patients receiving any of the antibody products and 6% in the placebo group. Of the 15 people meeting the hospitalization or ED visit endpoint, 12 were due to hospitalizations and three were due to ED visits. A post hoc analysis was performed to assess hospitalizations and ED visits for two high risk patient groups, those 65 years and older and those with a BMI of 35 or higher. None of the patients receiving combination therapy experienced the hospitalization or ED visit, whereas three to 6% of monotherapy patients and 13.5% of patients receiving placebo experienced this outcome. All doses of the antibody therapy were well tolerated, with the majority of adverse events being mild in nature. Infusion-related reactions were observed in eight patients receiving active treatment, but none of these reactions interfered with the completion of the full infusion. The most common adverse events noted across all groups were nausea, diarrhea, and dizziness, with similar rates among treatment and placebo groups. Overall, administration of the combination of bamlanivimab and etisevimab significantly lowered viral load compared to patients receiving placebo. While this did not appear to have a profound effect on any symptom-related outcome, the lower rates of hospitalization and ED visits, especially among high-risk patients, was promising. This brings us to the Phase 3 portion of the BLAZE-1 trial, which was set up very similar to the Phase 2 portion. Key differences in the inclusion criteria include a lower age cutoff, enrolling patients as young as 12, and a requirement that all enrolled patients must have at least one risk factor for progression to severe disease. The list of risk factors is listed on the next slide and is nearly identical to the definition of high risk used in the initial monoclonal antibody emergency use authorization guidance from November 2020. The other key difference between this study and the previously published Phase 2 trial is that the Phase 3 portion of BLAZE-1 was designed specifically to look at clinical endpoints as the primary outcome, which was necessary in order to confirm the secondary outcome findings that looked so promising with the Phase 2 data. At least two different doses of the bamlanivimab and etisevimab combination have been studied, with published results available for both the 2800mg, 2800mg arm and the 700 mg, 1400 mg arm. Per the study protocol, two other even lower doses, including one being administered subcutaneously, are also being studied as part of the BLAZE-1 trial. However, no results have been made available for these arms to date. With the exception of a few additions to the adolescent category, the definition of high-risk patients for trial inclusion purposes was identical to the definition of high-risk published in the first iteration of the monoclonal antibody emergency use authorization.
The baseline characteristics for the patient populations of both published studies are shown here. The average age of patients across all arms was in the mid-50s, with about 30% of patients being above the age of 65. Despite lowering the enrollment age to 12 years, a very small number of patients between the ages of 12 and 18 were included. The top three high-risk conditions among enrolled patients were diabetes in all patients, and hypertension or COPD among adult patients at least 55 years old. The vast majority of patients were categorized as having only mild disease and, despite no cap on symptom duration as an inclusion criteria, the median duration of symptoms was low at just three to four days. The primary outcome results for both studies are shown here with high-dose results in the table on the top and low-dose results on the bottom. Hospitalization or death from any cause occurred in 2% of patients receiving antibody therapy compared to 7% among those receiving placebo, a 70% risk reduction among patients receiving the 2,800 milligram doses. Similar rates of just under 1% and 6% were observed in patients receiving low-dose bamlanivimab and etisevimab, or placebo, respectively. The majority of patients meeting the primary endpoint did so due to hospitalizations with no patients who received either dose of the monoclonal antibody dying by day 29. 13 of the 14 deaths among patients receiving placebo were attributed to COVID-19 infection. Other notable outcomes from both publications are shown here. When ED visits were added to the composite outcome, the numbers didn't change too much, with anywhere from zero to two additional patients being added to any of the arms. The time to symptom resolution was significantly shorter among patients randomized to receive bamlanivimab and etisevimab with symptoms resolving after a median of eight days in the treatment arms and nine to 10 days in the placebo arms. Interestingly, in the instances where monoclonal antibody administration did not prevent a hospitalization, it may have still provided some overall benefit in decreasing the patient's length of stay, with durations of admission noted to be four days shorter among patients receiving antibody therapy compared to those receiving placebo. Similar to what was observed in the phase two trial, the change in viral load from baseline to day seven was significantly greater for patients receiving the bamlanivimab and etisevimab combination compared to the placebo group. Persistently high viral load, which was defined through a post hoc analysis of blaze one phase two trial data and defined as a cycle threshold of less than 27 and a half or a viral load of 5.27 log 10 or greater at day seven was found to be significantly associated with hospitalization or all-cause mortality by day 29. Across all BLAZE-1 study groups, about 70% of patients experiencing hospitalization or death by day 29 had a persistently high viral load on day 7. In patients who did not meet this endpoint, their rates of persistently high viral load by day 7 were only 13 to 25%. All of this to say that in both trials, patients who received monoclonal antibody therapy had significantly lower rates of persistently high viral load compared to patients receiving placebo. The most common adverse events in each of the dosing groups are shown here, with low rates of serious adverse events across all trial arms. The top adverse events in the high dose group were nearly identical compared to the phase two trial, but the laboratory abnormalities observed among patients in the low dose group were not previously seen. Next, we have the BLAZE-4 trial, which has preliminary results that were originally made available with the release of the initial bamlanivimab and etisevimab EUA fact sheet. This original version of the fact sheet is no longer available, and the BLAZE-4 trial information has since been removed from newer iterations, but the data is still available on the CEDAR website in their published documents supporting EUA for bamlanivimab and etisevimab. BLAZE-4 is a phase two trial looking primarily at rates of virologic failure, defined as high viral load on day seven, for various treatment regimens, including bamlanivimab monotherapy, two combinations of bamlanivimab and etisevimab, and a combination of bamlanivimab and sutrovimab, an antibody produced by GSK and Veer Biotechnology. Importantly, this trial excluded two big risk groups, patients 65 and older, and patients with BMIs of 35 or greater. Baseline characteristics for the combined treatment and placebo groups to date are listed here. 
About 150 patients were enrolled in the lower dose bamlanivimab and etisavimab arm, and 100 patients each in the 2800 milligram bamlanivimab and etisavimab arm and the bamlanivimab monotherapy arm. Preliminary data were reported for the two bamlanivimab and etisavimab combination arms, as well as the placebo arm. Virologic failure occurred in 14% and 10% of patients in the low-dose and high-dose combination groups, respectively. Both of these frequencies were significantly lower than the 31% rate of virologic failure among patients randomized to placebo. The graph on the right shows the viral load change from baseline through day 11 for three treatment groups and the placebo group. The results are consistent with previously reported data showing greater rates of change for patients receiving combination therapy than for monotherapy or placebo. All of the data discussed up to this point have been focused on treating ambulatory patients. However, the BLAZE-2 trial is an ambulatory trial assessing the ability of monoclonal antibodies to prevent COVID-19 disease. The full BLAZE-2 protocol does include an arm receiving bamlanivimab and etisavimab, but currently the only published results are for the bamlanivimab monotherapy arm. The monotherapy results will be discussed here despite the bamlanivimab monotherapy EUA revocation because this is the information that was used to inform the FDA and secure EUA expansion for bamlanivimab and etisavimab as post-exposure prophylaxis. This trial was conducted in nursing homes and assisted living facilities and enrolled both staff and residents. In order to facilitate rapid enrollment into the trial, patients were enrolled once an index case was identified prior to knowing whether the participant was SARS-CoV-2 positive or negative. However, only the patients who were PCR negative at baseline were evaluated in this portion of the BLAZE-2 trial. Patients were then tested weekly for SARS-CoV-2 and the primary outcome was development of symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection by day 57. Roughly 300 nursing home or assisted living residents and 670 staff members were enrolled into the trial. Not surprisingly, there were large differences in median age between the two groups. All residents were considered to be high risk just by virtue of residing in the facility, while only about 40% of staff had risk factors for development of severe disease. Significantly fewer instances of progression to symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 were noted among patients who received post-exposure prophylaxis with bamlanivimab monotherapy. However, when the residents and staff were evaluated separately, as depicted in the graphs on the bottom here, the overall outcome was primarily driven by the resident group. Likely due to the high-risk nature of the entire resident population, nursing home and assisted living residents receiving post-exposure prophylaxis were significantly less likely to develop symptomatic infection. This was not true of staff, where no significant difference in the primary outcome was observed. Additionally, the frequency of SARS-CoV-2 infection, regardless of the presence of symptoms, was evaluated, with significantly fewer symptomatic and asymptomatic infections noted among participants receiving post-exposure prophylaxis. The administration of bamlanivimab also appeared to lessen the severity of disease among patients who did progress to symptomatic infection, with significantly fewer patients experiencing moderate or worse severity of infection in the treatment arm. In terms of safety, the frequency of serious events was nearly identical among treatment and placebo groups. The most common adverse events are listed in this table, with no striking differences between the groups. Based off of the findings from Blaze 1, Emergency use authorization for bamlanivimab combined with etisavimab was granted in early February 2021 for the treatment of patients at least 12 years in age with mild to moderate COVID-19 who are at high risk of progressing to severe disease. Due to concerns with its activity against gamma and beta variants, distribution was halted over the summer. However, as the delta variant became dominant and this combination was found to retain activity against this variant, distribution was resumed in late August and as of early September was once again available nationwide with the caveat that should the prevalence of resistant variants rise above 5% in any given area, distribution may again be halted. In addition, in mid-September, the combination of bamlanivimab and etisavimab received an additional emergency use authorization for post-exposure prophylaxis based on the results of the BLAZE-2 trial. 
The approved dose of this antibody combination is 700 mg of bamlanivimab and 1400 mg of etisevimab, combined and administered intravenously one time. The infusion duration is variable depending on patient's body weight and the diluent volume used. Patients should be monitored for at least one hour after infusion as hypersensitivity reactions, including anaphylaxis and infusion-related reactions, have been reported. In summary, the combination of bamlanivimab and etisevimab significantly reduces viral load compared to placebo in ambulatory patients with mild to moderate disease. Administration of this combination also resulted in significant reductions in hospitalizations and deaths when administered within three days of a positive SARS-CoV-2 test with a relative risk reduction of 70%. In addition, there is a role for administration of this combination to prevent development of symptomatic infection in uninfected patients, especially those who reside in a high-risk setting. The next monoclonal antibody therapy that I'm going to review is the combination of casarivimab and imdevimab, also referred to as Regencove, manufactured by Regeneron. This product is a combination of two of the four antibody finalists isolated using genetically humanized mice and B cells derived from convalescent patients. All four monoclonal antibody finalists had potent neutralizing activity as shown in the figure on the left side of the slide. In addition to testing the neutralization capabilities of the four individual antibodies, combinations of two antibodies were examined. However, no improvement in neutralization activity was demonstrated with either combination. The components or individual products highlighted in the red boxes represent the compounds ultimately included in the final Regeneron product. The ability of each monoclonal antibody to carry out effector functions was studied as well. Regen 10987, the red line in the figures on the right, was the most effective at mediating cytotoxicity of the SARS-CoV-2 virus at around 20%. The ability to mediate antibody-dependent phagocytosis was also examined for each of the monoclonal antibody finalists with Regen 10989, 87, and 33 all displaying similar induction potential of around 55% and Regen 10934, about 15 percentage points lower. The rate of virus mutation under selection pressure from the four previously discussed individual antibodies, as well as three different antibody combinations was investigated. Virus grown in the presence of the combination of casarivimab and imdevimab did not result in the growth of any escape mutants. This is thought to be because there is no overlap in the binding locations of each of the two individual agents within the receptor binding domain, and thus there is a lower probability of simultaneous viral mutation occurring at two distinct genetic sites. Although the combination of Regen 10989 and Regen 10987 appears to block growth of escape mutants as well, the two antibodies in this cocktail do partially compete for binding sites, which is less ideal. The results of these two in vitro studies placed the combination of casarivimab and imdevimab as the leading contender selected for clinical trials in both animal and human studies. Animal models using Regencove for prophylaxis and treatment have been performed with rhesus macaques and golden hamsters. In the macaque model, two studies were performed using two different viral inocula. The first study administered a 50 mg per kg antibody dose to six animals and placebo to six animals, followed by administration of a viral inoculum of 1 times 10 to the 5th plaque forming units three days later. Nasopharyngeal swabs and bronchoalveolar fluid were collected on specified days for viral load assessment. The second study utilized a tenfold higher viral inoculum and compared the activities of two different antibody doses. 0.3 mg per kg and 50 mg per kg to placebo in 12 animals, 4 in each group. In this study, nasopharyngeal and oral swabs were collected for viral load assessment. In the treatment study, 8 animals received one of two different doses, either 25 mg per kg or 150 mg per kg of the antibody combination one day after being inoculated with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Nasopharyngeal and oral swabs were collected. Similar to the bamlanivimab animal model previously discussed, Changes in both genomic RNA and subgenomic RNA were observed. Findings from the prophylaxis models are described on the left side of the slide. Both prophylaxis models showed more rapid clearance of genomic RNA 
among animals receiving the 50 mg per kg dose as compared to placebo. Most significantly, the subgenomic RNA was almost completely ablated in both groups of animals receiving the 50 mg per kg dose, signaling near complete blockage of viral infection even among animals administered a higher viral inoculum, as depicted in the figure on the left. The lower 0.3 mg per kg dose did not appear to offer any protection against viral infection. In the treatment model, both antibody doses displayed similar rates of viral clearance and efficacy. Importantly, higher viral titers were noted on day one for the group receiving the 150 mg per kg dose, which may have potentially masked any enhanced antiviral activity. Lastly, pathological lung findings of SARS-CoV-2 were documented less frequently among animals in both the prophylaxis and treatment groups and, when present, were less extensive than in animals who received placebo. Antibody activity was also studied in golden hamsters, where SARS-CoV-2 infection manifests much more severely than in the macaques. Both the prophylaxis and treatment models studied the effects of three different doses against the viral inoculum of 2.3 times 10 to the fourth platforming units. Infection with SARS-CoV-2 in hamsters results in rapid weight loss and high viral load in the lungs. As such, animals were assessed for weight loss over the seven days post-infection. Additionally, in the prophylaxis model, viral load in the lungs at day seven was examined. Protection from weight loss was observed across all antibody regimens in the prophylaxis model and among the two highest doses in the treatment model. Both genomic and subgenomic RNA were decreased from baseline in most of the animals receiving prophylactic antibodies. Importantly, even in animals whose viral loads showed less of a response to prophylactic administration of antibodies, protection from weight loss was still demonstrated. Multiple trials assessing the clinical efficacy of the Regeneron product have been completed with others ongoing. Some results are available for outpatient treatment, post-exposure prophylaxis, and notably, there are two trials examining the role of Regen Cope in hospitalized patients. All of this available data will be discussed on the following slides. A few new trials have also been posted recently that are starting to look into phase one outcomes of pharmacokinetic safety, tolerability, and efficacy in pediatric populations under 12 years of age. The Regeneron sponsored outpatient treatment trial of Regen Co is a seamless phase one, two, and three trial examining the efficacy and safety of two different doses of the combination of casarivimab and imdevimab compared to placebo. Interim results from the first 275 patients enrolled in the phase two portion were published in the New England Journal of Medicine at the end of 2020. Since that time, the final data set and analysis has been made available for all 799 patients enrolled in the phase two trial. Enrolled patients were all non-hospitalized adults, seven days or fewer from symptom onset with a positive COVID-19 test within 72 hours of randomization. What sets this trial apart from the bamlanivimab etisevimab trials is the limitation on symptom duration, as well as that the anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody screening was performed in all patients upon entrance to the study. Patients' baseline serologic status did not affect randomization, but was taken into account when the outcomes were reported. The pre-specified virologic outcome was viral load change from baseline through day seven among patients who were serum antibody negative at baseline. The pre-specified clinical outcome evaluated the proportion of patients with at least one medically attended visit defined as any office visit, telemedicine visit, urgent care visit, ER visit, or hospitalization in the overall study population, as well as in the seronegative subgroup. Demographics of all randomized patients are described here. There appears to be a good representation of traditionally underrepresented populations for clinical trials, with over half the population being Hispanic or Black, and over one-third being obese. Over half of all patients had at least one risk factor for hospitalization, which was defined as age above 50, obesity, cardiovascular disease, a number of chronic lung, metabolic, kidney, or liver diseases, and immunocompromise, meaning either immunosuppression or receipt of immunosuppressants. Before I get into the results, it is important to point out the difference in baseline viral loads between seronegative patients, those who did not mount an antibody response, and seropositive patients. 
This information is presented as two different groups because the data were published in two separate publications. Group 1 was the first 275 patients enrolled and reported in the interim analysis, and Group 2 is the remainder. You can see here that there is an incredibly large difference in the median baseline viral loads between the two serogroups. There was also a smaller group of patients who had an unknown serology status at baseline, meaning their serology status was either unable to be evaluated or they had borderline results. These patients had baseline viral loads somewhere between those seen in the seronegative and seropositive groups. In group one, the first set of 275 patients, treatment in both the 2.4 gram and 8 gram dosing groups showed numerically greater viral load reduction compared to placebo. And when you break it down by baseline antibody status, the decreases appear to be driven by the seronegative population. In the pre-specified key virologic endpoint patient population, of those who were seronegative at baseline, viral load decreases were between 0.5 and 0.6 uh, log copies per ml greater for either treatment group compared to placebo. Group two data were presented with additional baseline information. So you can see that overall viral load changes were greater both among seronegative patients as seen with group one and also with patients who had high baseline viral loads. In terms of medically attended visits, two thirds of these were hospitalizations or ED visits with the remaining one third being split between urgent care office or telemedicine visits. Overall, just under 3% of patients who received monoclonal antibody treatment had a medically attended visit at day 29 compared to 6.5% of patients in the placebo arm. Similar to viral load changes, the impact of casirivimab and imdevimab on medically attended visits was more pronounced among patients who are seronegative at baseline. Baseline serostatus and baseline viral load do appear to be good predictors of patients who may benefit most from receipt of antibody therapy. However, neither are a practical value to obtain prior to deciding whether to administer monoclonal antibody therapy to a patient. Over 80% of the patients in this study who had risk factors for severe disease or hospitalization were also found to be seronegative or having a baseline viral load above 10 to the fourth. So these risk factors are thought to be a helpful indicator of who would benefit most from monoclonal antibody therapy. In terms of safety, all serious adverse events were deemed to be related to COVID-19 disease and or associated clinical conditions and not to the study drug treatment. No differences in serious adverse events were reported between the treatment and placebo groups. In addition, events of special interest, including infusion-related reactions or hypersensitivity reactions that were grade two or higher, occurred infrequently in all treatment groups. The phase three portion of this outpatient treatment trial enrolled three separate cohorts of outpatients, adult patients 18 years and older, patients between ages 12 and 18, and pregnant patients. The currently available data are for the non-pregnant adult patients only. So this will be the only cohort discussed in this presentation at this time. All adult patients were treated as outpatients and identical to the phase two trial were required to be seven days or fewer from symptom onset with a positive COVID-19 test within 72 hours of randomization. Patients were initially randomized to either a 2,400 milligram dose or an 8,000 milligram dose. However, when the phase two results were noted to show no real differences in both viral load and clinical outcomes between the two doses, the higher dose was dropped and a lower dose arm of 1200 milligrams was added. In addition, the phase two trial findings also led to the requirement for enrolled patients in the phase three portion to have at least one risk factor for severe COVID-19 disease, as these were the patients who were noted to be most likely to benefit from treatment. The primary endpoint is identical to the primary endpoint of the phase three bamlanivimab and etisevimab trial, the proportion of patients with COVID-19 related hospitalization or death from any cause by day 29. The trial enrolled over 700 patients in the lower dose 1.2 gram arm and over 1300 patients in the higher dose 2.4 gram arm. Only a small portion were over age 65 and the top three risk factors for severe disease among enrolled patients were age of 50 years or greater, BMI of 30 or greater, and cardiovascular disease. Only 3% of patients in this trial were immunocompromised or on an immunosuppressive medication. About 70% of patients in this trial were seronegative at baseline, and patients had symptoms for a median of three days prior to enrollment. 
The primary outcome of hospitalization or all-cause death occurred in about 1% of patients receiving either monoclonal antibody dose, which was found to be significantly lower than the 3 to 5% of patients randomized to placebo. This was a relative risk reduction of 70% in both treatment arms. When patients were stratified by baseline viral load or sero status, just as in the phase two part of the trial, the patients with high viral load or who were sero negative at baseline received a significant benefit from being administered monoclonal antibody therapy. In terms of secondary outcomes, the time to symptom resolution was 10 days in both treatment arms, which was noted to be significantly lower than the 14 days to symptom resolution among patients receiving placebo. As anticipated, serious adverse events remained low in this trial. The two treatment emergent events leading to death among patients receiving antibody therapy were hypoxia in one patient and dyspnea in one patient. Common adverse events were predominantly pulmonary in nature, things like pneumonia, dyspnea, and cough, with GI adverse effects documented in 0.1% or less of patients. We're now going to move away from the outpatient treatment and into outpatient prophylaxis. COVE-2069 is a phase three trial evaluating the efficacy of casirifumab and imdevimab administered as prophylaxis to non-hospitalized adults and adolescents as young as 12 who reside in a household with someone who has tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 and who intends to remain in that residence for the next 29 days. Participants had to test negative for SARS-CoV-2 to be included in this portion of the trial and were randomized to receive a one-time subcutaneous dose of 1,200 milligrams of the combination antibody product or placebo. The primary outcome of development of symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection was evaluated among seronegative patients only. Baseline demographics for the seronegative patients are shown here. Just about 750 patients were included in each arm with 68 patients total included under the age of 18. 75% of all participants had at least one risk factor for severe disease as defined by the most recent EUA fact sheet. Significantly fewer patients who received casirivimab and imdevimab went on to develop symptomatic infection, 1.5% compared to about 8% in the placebo arm, which was an 81% relative risk reduction. As a note, there was a pretty broad definition for what constituted symptomatic for this endpoint. However, additional analyses using a more strict definition as well as using the CDC definition of symptomatic were performed. And regardless of the definition used, the patients randomized to receive Regen Cove consistently had significantly fewer symptomatic infections. 90% of patients who received casirivimab and imdefimab and went on to develop symptomatic infection did so within the first week with only two patients developing infection after seven days. During the same time frame, just under 50% of placebo patients who went on to develop symptomatic infections had done so, with the remaining 50% continuing to occur up until around three weeks from placebo administration. Here you can see the rates of development of symptomatic infection for various subgroups, including high-risk seronegative patients, seropositive patients, and various age groups. In terms of secondary outcomes, the study also looked at how many patients developed SARS-CoV-2 infection regardless of symptoms and found that this too occurred significantly less frequently among patients who received the casirivimab and imdevimab combination. Additionally, the duration of infection, duration of high viral load, and duration of symptoms were all significantly lower among participants who received antibody therapy. Rates of serious events were low across the entire trial, with no serious events in the casirivimab and imdevimab group considered to be related to COVID-19 or antibody therapy. Despite 11 patients developing symptomatic COVID-19, none of the participants who received antibody therapy presented to the ED or had to be hospitalized due to their infection. None of the four deaths among trial participants were attributed to COVID-19. Notably, Injection site reactions occurred in 4.2% or 55 patients in the treatment arm. This is notably higher than the number of infusion-related reactions 
in other monoclonal antibody studies, and this is likely related to the subcutaneous administration used in this study. Participants enrolled in this trial were followed past the initial 29 days and for an additional seven months to determine the long-term efficacy of this single-dose combination antibody. After the first month, patients were allowed to receive vaccination against COVID-19 disease, and about 35% of patients in each of the trial arms elected to do so. At the end of month eight, only seven additional infections were added to the antibody-treated patient pool, but 38 were added in the placebo group. Because the duration of this follow-up extends past the immediate duration of when the participants were residing with an infected individual, this shows the ability of monoclonal antibody treatment to prevent not only acquisition of infection among close household contacts, but among the broader community as well. The trial that we just finished discussing randomized patients prior to knowing the results of the enrollee's SARS-CoV-2 PCR test which means that there was a proportion of enrolled patients who received casirivimab and imdevimab, but were excluded from cohort A, the prophylaxis trial we just discussed, as they were already SARS-CoV-2 positive at the time of antibody administration. These asymptomatic PCR patients were followed as cohort B in order to assess the effect of antibody administration on progression to symptom development within 14 days of positive tests in patients already known to have COVID-19 disease. Other than the exception of being infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, all other inclusion criteria and treatment arms were the same. In terms of baseline characteristics, the most important thing to point out is that only about one third of the enrolled population had at least one risk factor for progression to severe disease. So this was a relatively low risk patient population overall. There was a significantly lower frequency of progressing from asymptomatic to symptomatic infection within 14 days from positive PCR tests among patients randomized to receive monoclonal antibody therapy. This outcome occurred in 29% of patients receiving casirivimab and imdevimab, and 42% of patients receiving placebo. No deaths occurred in the monoclonal antibody group compared to six deaths in the placebo group. The relative risk reduction here for development of symptoms is 31.5%. Similar to what was noted in cohort A, duration of symptoms and duration of high viral load were both significantly lower among the patients who received casirivimab and imdevimab. No serious adverse events occurred in patients who received the combination monoclonal antibody. Comparatively, three of the four serious events in the placebo arm were COVID-related. Grade 1 and 2 injection site reactions did occur in six patients in the regen co group and in one patient in the placebo group. The two trials we've discussed so far have used different routes to administer casirivimab and imdevimab, so I wanted to take a couple of minutes to review what is known about these two administration techniques. We still don't have a robust understanding of the pharmacodynamic targets for the monoclonal antibodies, but we do know that subcutaneous dosing of medications in general is typically associated with a slower absorption and time to peak serum concentration than intravenous administration, so pharmacokinetic differences would be expected. In the table on the left, you can see that the peak antibody concentrations are just under 200 mg per liter for both casirivimab and imdevimab when administered intravenously, and looking at the yellow data points in the graph on the right, are achieved almost immediately after infusion completion. Conversely, maximum serum concentrations after subcutaneous administration are only about one quarter of those achieved after IV administration and are achieved around day seven to eight. The concern for these differences is that the delay in achieving critical concentrations at the site of pharmacological action may impact overall efficacy. However, as we'll see on the next slide, the issue may not be as significant as this data may lead us to believe. We do not currently have clinical trial data demonstrating the clinical efficacy of subcutaneous regen cove like we have for the treatment of mild to moderately symptomatic outpatients with intravenous administration. Unpublished information provided to the FDA and available in the CEDAR scientific review documents comparing viral load reductions with intravenous and subcutaneous administration of a 1.2 gram dose is shown here, with circles representing intravenous administration 
in triangles representing subcutaneous administration. You can see that both administration routes perform similarly in decreasing viral load. The research team concluded that pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data support the use of a 1.2 gram subcutaneous dose for treatment of COVID-19 when IV dosing is not feasible and would result in a delay in treatment. However, for post-exposure prophylaxis, because subcutaneous was the route of administration studied, no preference is made for one route over the other. Emergency use authorization for casarivimab and imdevimab was granted in November 2020, with post-exposure prophylaxis authorization following at the end of July 2021. The EUA recommended dose is 1.2 grams, with subsequent lower doses of 600 milligrams every four weeks recommended for patients with long-term exposures. This repeat dosing regimen is based off of known pharmacokinetic data and dose needed to maintain a 28-day trough consistent with previously observed 28-day concentrations. The safety of repeat doses was studied in a phase one trial of just over 700 patients who received 1.2 grams of subcutaneous casarivimab and imdevimab every four weeks for up to six doses. Treatment emergent events, including grade three or greater events and serious adverse events, occurred at a similar frequency to patients receiving placebo. This study also looked at the efficacy of this dosing strategy in preventing COVID-19 among healthy volunteers who tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 on enrollment as an exploratory endpoint and noted a 92% relative risk reduction in symptomatic COVID-19 disease among the patients receiving this continued antibody prophylaxis. The Regeneron combination product is also being studied as treatment for patients admitted to the hospital with COVID-19. This trial initially enrolled patients in four different cohorts stratified by oxygen needs, patients not requiring oxygen, patients on low flow oxygen, patients on high flow oxygen, and patients on mechanical ventilation. In October 2020, an independent data monitoring committee recommended pausing further enrollment of patients requiring high flow or mechanical ventilation due to a potential safety signal and an unfavorable risk benefit profile. The no oxygen and low flow oxygen arms continued to enroll patients. However, the trial was ultimately stopped due to low enrollment just prior to the Delta surge. Inclusion criteria for this trial included an overall symptom duration of 10 days or fewer. Patients were randomized to receive a single dose of either 2.4 grams or 8 grams of casarivimab and imdevimab or placebo. Outcomes included the virologic endpoint of change in viral load through day 7 and the clinical endpoint of disease progression requiring mechanical ventilation or death. In terms of baseline characteristics, patients experienced a median of six days of COVID-19 illness prior to antibody administration, and just under half of the patients were seronegative at baseline. About 55% of patients received concomitant remdesivir, and three quarters received corticosteroids. Just over half of the enrolled patients required low flow oxygen supplementation with the remaining having no supplemental oxygen needs. The change in viral load from baseline through day seven was significantly greater when compared to placebo among the combined group of all patients who received casarivimab and imdevimab. As it was previously mentioned, this trial was stopped early due to low enrollment as it was actively enrolling during the COVID lull just before the Delta surge. Because of this, the decision was made to combine the two treatment arms for the efficacy analyses. The way that the statistical analysis of the clinical outcomes were structured, a hierarchy was created for the two clinical endpoints, mechanical ventilation or death between day 6 and 29, and mechanical ventilation or death between day 1 and day 29, and for various populations, high viral load, seronegative, and full analysis set. The first test done was for mechanical ventilation or death between day six and day 29. And because the difference in outcomes between these groups did not reach statistical significance with 10% uh, of antibody treated patients experiencing mechanical ventilation or death compared to 13% receiving placebo, all subsequent clinical efficacy analyses are considered descriptive only. The subgroup analyses shown here show the breakdown by baseline zero status 
for 28-day mortality, as well as progression to mechanical ventilation or death. The relative risk reduction for both of these outcomes was about 50% among seronegative patients. Serious adverse events occurred in 14 patients in the combined treatment arm, but at a frequency of 1% were low overall. Infusion-related reactions were a little bit higher in this study than in previous studies using intravenous infusions, but only four reactions overall in the treatment arms led to the need to stop the infusion. A second inpatient treatment trial has been performed using the recovery platform. This was a randomized controlled open-label trial evaluating many potential therapies for patients hospitalized with COVID-19, including a treatment arm which randomized patients to eight grams of casarivimab and imdevimab. These patients were at least 12 years of age and had clinically suspected or laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2. In addition, there were no stipulations on need for oxygenation or type of oxygenation among the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Patients could also have been simultaneously randomized to one of a number of other investigational treatments or usual care. The primary outcome of the recovery trial is 28-day all-cause mortality. The median duration of symptoms prior to enrollment in this trial was nine days, which is noticeably longer than the median durations in the outpatient treatment trials. This lines up with the disease state trajectory and the fact that most patients don't experience severe symptoms requiring hospital admission until around this time. The majority of patients required supplemental oxygen via simple methods and nearly all patients received corticosteroids. 28-day all-cause mortality was found to be significantly decreased among seronegative patients who received casarivimab and imdefimab, but this significance went away when all patients, both seronegative and seropositive, were included in the analysis. Overall, among seronegative patients, there was a 20% reduction in mortality at 28 days. In the subgroup analyses shown here, patients who received antibody administration within seven days of symptom onset or who had lower supplemental oxygen needs appeared to benefit the most from receipt of monoclonal antibody therapy. This is in line with the thought that neutralizing antibodies work best when administered before the disease process becomes too severe. In comparing these results to the previously discussed inpatient study, the differences in duration of symptoms and supplemental oxygen needs likely explain the higher mortality benefit noted in the other trial. And again, in line with what the outpatient treatment results have shown, patients seronegative at baseline were more likely to benefit with significantly higher rates of being discharged alive and lower rates of needing invasive mechanical ventilation or dying during the admission compared to usual care, differences which were not significant among the seropositive patients. Serious adverse events in the monoclonal antibody arm were low, with three patients experiencing allergic reactions, two seizures, one acute desaturation, and one transient loss of consciousness. In summary, the combination of casarivimab and imdevimab has shown the greatest effect on both viral load and clinical outcomes in seronegative patients or those with viral loads of 10 to the 6th or greater at baseline. Administration of this antibody combination has been shown to be effective in reducing hospitalizations and deaths in ambulatory patients displaying mild to moderate symptoms with risk factors for progression to severe disease. When administered as post-exposure prophylaxis to PCR-negative patients, Casarivimab and imdevimab significantly decrease the chances of developing a symptomatic infection both within the first 29 days while maintaining household contact with a known infected individual, as well as out to at least eight months from administration. While receipt of antibody prophylaxis did not eliminate the risk of development of symptomatic infection, it does appear to strongly reduce the chances of presenting to the ED or being hospitalized due to those symptoms. There is also a potential role for this combination in seronegative patients admitted to the hospital for COVID-19 disease on low levels of supplemental oxygen. The final monoclonal antibody therapy that will be discussed here is sotrovimab. All prior monoclonal antibodies discussed in this presentation 
were isolated, at least in part, from convalescing SARS-CoV-2 patients. Sotrovimab is different because it was actually one of 25 antibodies identified from a survivor of SARS-CoV back in 2003. The identified monoclonal antibodies were evaluated for their SARS-CoV-2 cross-neutralization activity with S309 noted to be the antibody with the most potent neutralization activity. In addition, the target epitope where S309 was noted to bind on the S protein is highly conserved among all SARBI coviruses, which is thought to be the reason for its high barrier to resistance. To date, there is nearly 100% conservation of the amino acids comprising the target epitope of S309 among more than 584,000 S protein sequences that have been reviewed. VER7831, or what is now known as citrovimab, is one of two monoclonal antibody products derived from S309. Citrovimab has modifications, giving it an extended half-life and also potentially enhancing distribution to the respiratory mucosa compared to the parent antibody. Similarly to the other monoclonals, antibody activity was studied in golden hamsters. Citrovimab was administered either one or two days prior to viral inoculation at four different doses. As a reminder, infection with SARS-CoV-2 in golden hamsters results in rapid weight loss, so this is the clinical outcome that was assessed. On day four, hamsters that had received either of the two highest doses, 5 mg per kg or 30 mg per kg, depicted in the figures as the dark blue-purple triangles, had significantly reduced weight loss compared to the control group, the red squares. In addition, the viral load was significantly decreased for these two higher doses as well. As with the other two antibody products, many clinical trials with citrovimab are ongoing, with results only available to date for Comet ICE. Comet ICE is a phase three trial evaluating the rates of hospitalization and death among patients receiving citrovimab administered as treatment to outpatients with mild to moderate COVID-19 symptoms. It was set up similarly to the phase three treatment trials of the other two monoclonal antibody products. The inclusion criteria of time from symptom onset to randomization had to be five days or fewer, in contrast to seven days or fewer in the Regeneron trial and no limit on symptom duration with Blaze 1. The risk factors for severe disease are listed here and are similar to the criteria from the other key phase three trials. In terms of baseline demographics, the most common risk factors for severe disease were BMI over 30, age of 55 years or greater, and diabetes requiring medication. The majority of participants were enrolled after three days of symptoms or fewer. There were just over 1,000 patients enrolled in this trial and split equally between the citrovimab and placebo groups. Patients who were randomized to receive citrovimab experienced significantly fewer hospitalizations or deaths by day 29, with a relative risk reduction of 79%. Of the six hospitalizations in the citrovimab group, half were thought to be COVID-19 related. Conversely, all of the hospitalizations or deaths in the placebo group were potentially related to COVID-19 disease. For secondary outcomes, when ED visits were thrown into the mix, there were seven additional cases in the citrovimab arm and nine in the placebo arm. All seven of the patients in the citrovimab group who had severe or critical progression of disease met this endpoint due to the need for low flow supplemental oxygen. Comparatively, of the 28 patients meeting this endpoint in the placebo arm, 12 of the 28 required low flow oxygen, 10 required non-rebreather, high flow or non-invasive ventilation, and four required mechanical ventilation or ECMO. In terms of safety events, there were actually more serious adverse events in the placebo arm, with two possibly related to study treatment, compared to no serious adverse events related to citrovimab. The most common adverse event was diarrhea, and infusion-related reactions were equal in both groups. In May 2021, Citrovimab became the third monoclonal antibody to receive emergency use authorization for treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 disease in adult and pediatric patients at high risk of progressing to severe disease.
The EUA recommended dose is 500 mg administered intravenously over 30 minutes. As with the other two antibody products, patients should be observed for one hour post-infusion for infusion-related and hypersensitivity reactions. I had mentioned BLAZE-4 earlier when we talked about the bamlanivimab monotherapy and bamlanivimab etisevimab arms. There is an additional arm looking at bamlanivimab and citrovimab. And as a reminder, this is a phase two trial looking at the impact of monoclonal antibodies on the rates of virologic failure in patients without the two key risk factors for severe disease of advanced age and obesity. A press release at the end of March 2021 discussed some preliminary findings of the bamlanivimab and citrovimab combination. Primarily, there was a 70% reduction in persistently high viral load at day seven among patients who received the combination antibody therapy. More importantly, and perhaps a reflection of the lower risk status of the participants, no incidences of hospitalization or death by day 29 were noted in either treatment group. It is somewhat interesting that persistently high viral load didn't appear to impact clinical outcomes in this population, but we await the publication of the full data set to gain a full understanding. In conclusion, although citrovimab is administered as a monotherapy monoclonal antibody agent, it is believed to have a low risk for development of resistance due to its binding site being highly conserved across all SARV coviruses. The administration of citrovimab led to significantly fewer hospitalizations and deaths among patients at high risk for severe disease. In addition, among patients who did end up requiring hospitalization, they had a low likelihood of ICU admission, death, or need for high supplemental oxygen administration if they received citrovimab therapy. Based on the three key phase three trials for treatment of ambulatory patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 disease, bamlanivimab atisevimab, casarivimab and devimab, and citrovimab have all received emergency use authorization to be used in adults and pediatric patients as young as 12 years who are at high risk for progression to severe COVID-19 disease. Limitations for use include patients admitted to the hospital specifically for COVID-19 disease or who have increased supplemental oxygen requirements above their baseline requirement. The EUA criteria for identifying patients at high risk of progressing to severe disease are listed here. It is important to note the caveat on the bottom of the slide that there may be additional factors not listed here that put a patient at higher risk. So the criteria are not meant to be an all-inclusive list and patients can and should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis to determine their potential eligibility. Bamlanivimab etisevimab and casarivimab imdevimab are the only monoclonal antibody therapies with authorization to be used as post-exposure prophylaxis in adults and pediatric patients as young as 12 who are at risk for progression to severe disease. These prophylactic options are not meant to be a substitute for vaccination, but rather an option for patients who are not yet fully vaccinated or who are not expected to mount an adequate immune response to a full vaccine series. In addition, patients must have a known exposure to an affected person or be at high risk for exposure due to their living situation. The last topic that I want to touch on in this presentation is the efficacy of all of these antibodies against the current variants of concern, which is primarily only the Delta variant at this time. Over the past almost two years, we've cycled through a few different variants of concern, including alpha, beta, gamma, and epsilon. Presently, however, Delta is by far the predominant variant and the only currently listed variant of concern. Clinical concerns with the Delta variant include increased transmissibility and concern for possible decrease in efficacy of some monoclonal antibody and vaccine products. The figure here depicts the entire spike protein in green and each of the different domains within the spike protein are shown in various colors. Common spike protein amino acid mutations are identified by the numbers and letters noted along the length of the entire amino acid sequence of the S protein. The receptor binding domain, where all currently available monoclonal antibodies are known to bind, is the salmon colored area with the receptor binding motif designated in purple. The two amino acid mutations highlighted here in the red box are the two staples of the Delta variant, L452R and T478K. 
There are some Delta Plus variants that have additional mutations, but they are currently rare. These two consistent mutations identified in the Delta variant exist within the receptor binding motif, which if you remember is the location where both bamlanivimab and etisavimab and casarivimab and imdevimab bind. So you could expect that these mutations may potentially alter their binding activity. Citropimab, on the other hand, does not bind within the receptor binding motif, so it wouldn't be expected to be affected to a significant degree by these mutations. When we look at the impact on binding activity for each individual antibody product, we see the following. In a traditional Delta variant with just L452R and T478K mutations, bamlanivimab binding is significantly impacted but would not be expected to retain any activity. However, etisavimab activity isn't altered, so this combination retains activity. The other two antibody products are not significantly impacted. However, if a Delta Plus isolate with an additional K417N mutation were to become more common, this would impact both bamlanivimab and etisavimab binding, rendering this product ineffective. Casarivimab would also be expected to be impacted by a K417N mutation, but imdevimab would retain activity, so that combination should remain active. Again, citrovimab activity doesn't appear to be impacted. Likewise, a Delta Plus isolate with an additional E484Q mutation would not be expected to impact the combined activity of bamlanivimab and etisavimab or casarivimab and imdevimab due to the retained activity of at least one of the two agents in the combination against this mutation. No specific data for citrovimab are available. However, given the location of this amino acid within the receptor binding motif, I would imagine it would have little impact on citrovimab activity. In order to provide a more visual representation of the information just discussed, these four figures show the neutralization activity of bamlanivimab, etisavimab, casarivimab, and imdevimab on three of the known variants, alpha, beta, and delta. As previously discussed, looking at the red line representing delta, all monoclonal antibodies, with the exception of bamlanivimab, retain potent neutralizing activity against this variant. In summary, we're in a good place right now with the Delta variant and our current monoclonal antibody options. We can only hope that this trend continues to remain true as we continue through this pandemic. There are multiple other monoclonal antibodies under investigation for treatment of inpatients and outpatients and as pre and post exposure prophylaxis. The antibody products listed here are the furthest along in clinical trials. Be sure to keep checking back here for the latest updates on bamlanivimab, etisavimab, casarivimab, imdevimab, citrovimab, as well as the pipeline antibodies listed here. Thank you to SIDP for the opportunity to present this information, and please feel free to contact me with questions regarding any of the information seen here.